Turn with me to Acts, the ninth chapter. Stand with me and turn with me to the book of Acts. The ninth chapter. We'll start at the first verse there. Book of Acts, the ninth. And I am reading from the New International Version. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The scripture as it is written. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. Take your neighbor by the hand and say to them, Friend, do you know who you're dealing with? I want to use as a subject this morning, figuring it out. Figuring it out. We, and the reason why, because I'm dovetailing into our theme um, for the year, which is discovering a new normal. When things have been turned upside down until they are turned right side up. Figuring it, or should I say, when things have been turned upside down, discovering a new normal uh, is when we, with the help of God, have those things turned upside down, turned right side up. And thematically, today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Epiphany in the Christian tradition, um, well, the day of Epiphany was the day that the wise men, or the Magi, showed up in Bethlehem to see the Christ child 12 days after the birth and show up Christmas morning. The Christian calendar proceeds annually in this way. The beginning of the Christian calendar year starts with Advent. Those are four weeks out, four Sundays, the Sunday, fourth Sunday out from Christmas Day, whatever day of the week Christmas is, but four Sundays prior to that is the day of Advent where we celebrate his, that he came before and anticipate his coming back again. The word Advent means coming. Advent concludes on Christmas Day or the day before because Christmas Day is the beginning of a 12-day season of Christmas Tide, German for Christmas season. Christmas season then concludes with the day of Epiphany on the 12th day of Christmas when the wise men, or not, should I say, the um, Magi, the astrologers who were descendants of the Jews that were taken into captivity by Babylon six centuries earlier with the Babylonian deportment of Jews from Jerusalem to Babylon and now descendants of them 12 days after Christ uh, was born show up in Bethlehem with gold frankincense and myrrh to honor the king of the Jews and that is what we call the day of Epiphany the season of Epiphany goes up into Ash Wednesday and that gives way to the season of Lent, which goes up into Christmas, or goes up to Easter morning, Resurrection morning, which begins Easter tide, which goes up into the day of Pentecost, 50 days later. Penta meaning 50, 50 days after the waving of the barley loaf, which coincides with the day of Pentecost. And then you have the season of Pentecost, which gives way to Vitzentide, and Vitzentide then goes all the way up until we get to Advent, and it goes all around and around and around. 
God. So we are in the fourth Sunday of the season of Epiphany when the, when the Magi comes from the East. And the reason why I catch myself when I get ready to say wise men is because why we call them the wise men was not because they were wise men when they came from the east they were magi they were astrologers they were people who charted their way by calculating the stars but they saw the christ and once they saw the light of the world the light caused the light bulb to go on over their head and once the light came on they could not go home the same way they came. So they came as magi of astrologers, but they left as wise men because once you have been in the presence of truth and the light has come on, you, go, go, you have had an epiphany. And when you have had an epiphany, which is that experience where the light bulb comes on and now your understanding is clearer and deeper, you can't go back the same way that you came as evidence that you have had an epiphanic experience. You can always tell when somebody's had an epiphany because they just can't go back the way that they came. You can't date the way you used to date. You can't kick it the way you used to kick it. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't dress the way you used to dress. A lot of things you can't do no more because there has been a change, there has been an epiphany. We are in the season where people are experiencing a deeper understanding, a clearer perception because they have been in the presence of the truth that's caused the light bulb to go on and now when they go forth, however they came, they leave a little wiser. As evidenced by the fact they ain't going back the same way that they came. And so while we're in the fourth season, the, the, the season of epiphany, and certainly these Magi coming from the east are now wise men because they have had an epiphany. It's not the only epiphany we have in scripture because there's an epiphany right here. We see in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Y'all with me this morning? And um, we have the experience of one of the greatest epiphanic experiences in the scripture where we have Saul of Tarsus. Saul who is a, he born in the city of Tarsus. Um, his father was a Jew who had Roman citizenship, which was unusual. He's like someone from born in Mexico who has legal status. He don't have to hide in the shadows as much as those that are undocumented. He was a Jew who had legal status and free passage throughout the Roman world. He was a privileged Jew, even though the Jews were a oppressed people within the Roman Empire, even oppressed people have a privileged class. He was a privileged individual among an oppressed people because he was born in the city of Tarsus at the age of 13 or 14. He was sent to Jerusalem by his father who had legal status to study under the famed Jewish prophet and scholar and teacher Gamaliel. Most of the leading Jewish scholars had been taught by Gamaliel. And there for the next six to seven years he was taught in Jewish history and Jewish law. And he was a, a, a young and up and coming agent of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish court. They were the strictest sect of Phariseeism. Pharisees were the jurors. They were the interpreters of the law. They were the keepers and the guardians of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is right doctrine. Orthopraxy is right practice that flows out of the right doctrine. They were the guardians of the traditions. They were the alt-right of the Jewish faith. They were the strictest sect. They spoke of law, not so much of grace. They were an unflinching, unyielding, uncompromising group, so to speak. And he was a young, intelligent, privileged, up-and-coming Pharisee, juror, who was paying his dues. And anybody coming along in the profession, you, whether you be 
I remember I was 25 years of age, the new preacher in town, trying to prove my worth to the older pastors, whether you're a young lawyer in, in, in a firm, um, uh, a, a young page in, in Congress, or a, a young doctor out there in the business, a young teacher, uh, a new principal at a school. Whenever you were the young one, up and coming, wet behind the ears, you, you're trying to prove your worth, establish your credibility. So with great zeal, he made himself available to this alt-right of the Jewish experience whose top agenda was to stamp out this Jesus thing. The Romans looked at the Christians, the disciples of Christ as simply an offshoot from radical Judaism. The Jews themselves looked at them as blasphemers of the faith. And so in the name of God, as prescribed by the law, they were going to put to death those who defiled the law by claiming that this barefoot itinerant from of all places, Nazareth, was claiming himself to be the son of God, death to him and them. And so now this privileged individual among this oppressed people is, has been weaponized by the Sanhedrin, by the court, given papers. Wherever you find them, drag them here, we'll give them trial. And with great zeal, we will put them to death. And the record is clear that Saul, men and women, he didn't, you know, he was believed in equal rights long before the, equal, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. He believed in equal rights for women. They got the right to die too. Men, women, children, search and seizures. He was, the, he was the ice of classical Judaism. Search him out, find him, drag him here in the name of God. You can always tell when an, a good idea has been radicalized because then people do the wrong thing for the right reason. Or within a right faith, they do wrong things because they have a distorted notion of that faith. There's a whole lot of wrong things being done in the name of God. God is right, but there's a lot of godly people doing, there's a lot of people of God doing some ungodly things. He's another person in the name of God who's doing ungodly things. He's been weaponized against believers of Christ. And now he is on his way to Damascus, Syria. Um, because he heard there are Christians there who have scattered, who've been shattered and scattered like roaches when the lights come on. Getting out of Jerusalem because the heat is on. The same Saul we find uh, in Acts 7, he first appears to us when Luke in, in, in very shrewd literary fashion kind of puts him in, in our periphery as he's standing there holding the coats while Stephen, one of the first six deacons of the church, is stoned to death. And, and with head bloodied but unviled, with invictus, righteous indignation, he, he, he looks toward heaven while the mob of, 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 of Pharisees stone him to death. He says, Lord, charge it not to their account. And as Jesus from the cross says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen died in like fashion with malice toward none, to use the words of Abraham Lincoln. And while Stephen was dying with dignity, Saul was holding the coats with a smirk and a sneer. He was the one who threw the rock and hid his hand. He was the one who amassed the mob but didn't in that instance want to get the blood on their hands and he stood there holding the coats while they stoned Stephen. And, and now he is fully weaponized on his way uh, to Damascus Road when something happens. I didn't say something, I said something, something. Something happened. In the physics of providence, <laughs> I said that's, that's an old term that I made up last night. <laughs> in the physics of providence, you know, in the physics they say, they say that every action causes an equal or greater reaction. And so in the providence of God, what is providence? The providence is God behind the scenes, moving things around to affect God's will. Even playing off our free choice, we still got free choice, but God gonna have the last word. And 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 you know, William Cullen Bryant said, "Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne." Yet that scaffold sways the future. Behind the dim unknown, stand of God within the shadows, keeping watch above His own. God is always within the shadows at work. 
God is always within the shadows at work. And God in the shadows at work in the providence of physics. Paul, who, or Saul rather, Saul who is fully weaponized on his way to Jerusalem, uh, proving himself to the old boy network on the Pharisees to, with, to, to search out and seize Christians, drag them back to, to Jerusalem. He is such a force that the God of history, who's got another plan for his life, has to push back with equal or greater force. Those, you know, sometimes we, we, we force God to come hard with us because we come in hard. Huh? If you come hard, Jesus said, as you meet it out to others, so shall it be meted out to you. And, and God comes hard on the Damascus road when Paul is riding atop a beast of burden and all of a sudden it says a flash of light shone round about him. The, 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 uh, what he would call another place paphistinosis, a Greek word which means a flood of light. When he would explain this same testimony decades later uh, to Agrippa, he says a flash of light shone round about me and struck me blind and slapped me from my beast of burden. There's the play they used to say your arms are too short to box with God. I don't care who you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how privileged you are. I don't care how, how highly you are positioned. There ain't nobody that God can't reach out and slap down. And smack down. Has God ever smacked you down? You, you touch your neighbor and say, God can get you. And if you ain't never, get, if you ain't, if you ain't never been got, keep fooling in God's business and you will get got. And you ain't been got till God got you. <laughs> and suddenly Paul, Paul, Saul finds himself on his back and blind saying, who are you, Lord? And he doesn't say Lord in a religious sense. He says it in a natural sense. Lord was a title for any, um, any, any esteemed person. A person of dignity was called Lord. It can be a business person or a political person or one who might refer to their father as Lord. Whoever had authority and power over you. He don't know who it is behind this light. He just knows whatever it was, it was strong enough to slap him down. And so he refers to it as Lord. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. You persecute me. When you mess with my church, you're messing with me. And, and we find the story of, 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 of Saul. Psychologists have tried to do this uh, a retrospective psychoanalysis of what was going on with, with, with Saul. That what is described here is a flash of light, maybe an externalizing what was an internal conversation going on in Saul. Who, who, who? was a young gifted man his life seemed so laid out for him his mother and father had privilege within an oppressed people they were a privileged sect they were a, a privileged group he was he had gotten the best of educations he had studied with the highest scholars he had a soaring intellect his talents were recognized early he joined the court at, at, at an earlier age he was a phenom and he was a rising star. His life seemed so laid out for him. He, some said he was probably destined to become the high priest of, of, of the Sanhedrin. And uh, he's proving his salt. And, and, and now he finds himself on his back and blind on the Damascus Road. And, and as people try to do these retrospective psychoanalysis of what was going on in the mind of, of Saul, some said it is an explosion of, of his conscience. Because while he was doing some wrong things, he thought he was right. But they said the thing about the conscience, so sometimes we're taught, we're taught, we're indoctrinated to think that wrong things are right for sake of principle. <coughs> hmm. we, we, we can be taught that something that of its own is wrong, it is right for sake of high principle. You can be taught that flying a plane into a building and killing by the thousands, somehow or another is right. You can be taught that certain people are savages and therefore removing them from their land and manifest destiny because a greater people you need to take that land is right. You can be taught that putting a woman, your woman, them women in their place is right because they're the weaker vessel and we're the stronger. You know, right here in our churches, we get taught so many wrong things. And we're weaponized 
doing wrong in the name of God. I remember when I was a young preacher, weaponized. When I wanted a cheap amen, I could get one. The quickest way to get one is say, God didn't make Adam and Steve. God made Adam and Eve. But I believed it. Why? Because that's all I ever heard. I never thought about it. I didn't question. We all are the beneficiaries of, 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 of good faith that has some bad ideas. You can have a bad thing in a good thing. It, 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 come on, somebody. We can, it, it, you come from a good home, but mom and daddy still had some bad habits. Love mom and them to death, but they wasn't perfect. Come on, somebody. And so we receive the good and the bad. You know, part of growing up is to learn that the tradition we come from, we have to, it, it, part of growing up and doing ethics is, is like learning how to eat fish. You got to learn how to eat the meat and spit out the bones. And, 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 but as I went along in my tradition and, and began to study and learn and go back to those scriptures and not simply take down the homophobic uh, 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 vomit that was given me by my tradition. Uh, then, then all of a sudden I begin to see clearer. Paul would say later, I chase a theft which chases me. I'm chasing God. God is really chasing me. And the more I chase God every now and then, he taps me on my shoulder and say, let's talk about this thing because you need to have some deeper understandings of folk. And, and, and I have found that those who follow God change their mind about some things. Oh, come on, somebody. Winston Churchill said, those who never change their mind about anything never change anything at all. Huh? And, 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 and here uh, the, we, we have the Apostle Paul, or who would become the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And, and while I'm at it, let me say, God did not change Saul's name to Paul as Abraham was changed to Abraham and Jacob was changed to Israel. No, Saul and Paul were simply Greek and Hebrew equivalents of the same name. There was no name change. Even later on in the text, he's referred by, to by God and others as Saul. He always called himself Saul. Paul was just his Greek. Paul was just the Greek equivalent of the same name, Saul. Saul here on the Damascus Road, who was a man who was weaponized because he was given a good faith with some bad ideas. But because he came from a place of faith and a desire to please God, the weight of the wrong things he does catches up to him on the Damascus Road. And his conscience begins to explode. It's like a soldier that has gone to war who's been indoctrinated to believe that the people he's killing deserve to be killed because there's something wrong with them. And you represent something superior, but deep down inside, there's a point at which you really, you're killing a child of God. And you want to know why there's so much suicide and PTSD among soldiers and others because there is a point at which the compass of the soul which always points up and no matter how many layers of nationalism and, and, and racial indoctrination and, 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 and patriotic fervor which is simply called trying to desensitize you to the value of others and distort your the value of yourself, it, the conscience and there's a point you realize we're all God's children. And every reason they give you to devalue somebody else's life and even to take that life, at the end of the day, is a bad reason. And it says that this internal, some believe that this is an internal conversation that is projected outwardly and expressed as a flash of light that's shown round about me. And, and who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. And every one of them people out there whose life you took, you took something from me. And he said, well, what would you have me to do, Lord? He says, I want you to get up and go to Damascus, into the city. You was on your way there like Magi to drop off some gifts and call a favor. But the light bulb about to go on. <laughs> it ain't going to, you're going to get there, but it ain't going to be like you thought it was going to be there. But just go there and I'll let you know more. Now we know when we read the story, we know what happens. Ananias comes and tells them that you're gonna, your God has chosen you to be a prophet to kings and, and, da, 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 and all of that. And God has to even talk to Ananias first because Ananias, he was among, they knew Paul or Saul rather. They knew who Saul was. He was mayhem. In the Allstate commercials, he was mayhem. You know, mayhem made a New Year's resolution this year that mayhem was going to be nice. 
and Mayhem said, well, his, since his, his New Year's resolution didn't last because our New Year's resolution didn't last. He says ours didn't last two weeks. So, uh, you know, by the time of the BCS championship game, Mayhem was back to his old ways, just burning up, tan up stuff. And uh, so God can stop Mayhem. And, and, and so now uh, Saul finds himself, uh, who, who was on his mission of mayhem, he's on his way to Damascus where he's going to learn further. But right now, you hear this, this, this question, this critical question shivering up. What would you have me to do, Lord? And he says, just go into Damascus and I will let you know. And so you, it, pause frame, freeze it. There you have Saul standing there and he doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know what's next. You're talking about epiphany. My brothers and my sisters, I would have you to know that epiphany in time may include what to do next. But epiphany in its first expression is always knowing what you can't do no more. And in most cases, there's a pause. There's some time between knowing what you supposed to do or opposed to do, what you ultimately are called to do. Clarity on that only comes after you're no longer distracted from the stuff you ain't supposed to do. So the epiphany of Saul on the Damascus Road, while they call it his epiphany, his epiphany is not referred to as the clarity he gets in Damascus when he talks to Ananias who says that God has called you, he has chosen you, anointed you to be his prophet, to his apostle, to the, to the Jews and to the Gentiles and their kings, and you shall suffer many things of his, for his cause. That's the clarity he would get later. But the epiphany is knowing that this mess about messing with Christians, I can't do that no more. I don't know, James, yet what I'm going to do, but I know what I can't go back to. It's the wise men knowing when they went home. We don't know what they did home, and they, when they got back home, they didn't know what they were going to do when they went back home. But they knew this. They could not go back to Herod in the way that they started. I can't go back there. Why is this important as us young adults are up here and they're in the dawning of their life and maybe wondering, Lord, what would you have me to do? You will never gain clarity on what God wants you to do if God don't first arrest you regarding that stuff that you got no business doing. Because false pursuits have a way of deafening us to the voice of God. We can't hear God because there's too much noise. There's too much noise. There's too much Facebook noise. There's too much Snapchat noise. There's too much different boyfriend every week noise. There's too much mama drama. There's too much girlfriend drama. There's too much club drama. You, God can't get in the word edge. Why? You can't see the will of God. You can't see the purpose of God because you're too, too, too distracted you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to do this, trying to do that, trying to court, climb the corporate ladder. Your life seems so laid out. You can't see God's purpose because mama didn't been telling you all your life you're going to do this you're going to do that you're going to do that you don't see everybody else has a picture and a vision for your life and God's purpose can't be seen and you've come at it so hard you so headstrong about what you going to do what you ain't going to do what you going to take what you ain't going to take what you got to have in terms of salary index what kind of job what kind of person you so headstrong that God has to come at you really strong to knock you down and blind you just to get you to see you can't keep doing what you doing And in all your mess, there's enough God in you that God can stop you. He may have done some wrong things, but there was at a point in him of the desire to do right. And that's what God is pulling at. And I found that in my own life. I can be, I, I've been duped by the devil, handed it a flawed tradition, a family with high levels of dysfunction, your own personal proclivities for sin that can land you in some crazy places and come at it so hard that in the physics of providence, 
The God whom says he chastises whom he loves. You know, there's a great act of love that God slapped him down. God had to come hard. Some people see it as an act of judgment. Why God letting me, this happen to me? That's love, baby. I didn't understand it as a child. I got whooped by so many people kept turning around saying, I did, I did that because I love you. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand it. And I didn't even want this love that it just kept. I, I wanted a love that was sweeter. I didn't want this love that involved switches and and when I mumbled under my breath when mom was doing the dishes and she pulled that in one smooth motion pulled that wet dish rag right out the water and I said something said, I'm sick of you trying to tell me what to do and in one smooth motion the Holy Ghost got a hold of her and she said oh pow and I said couldn't see no love and that in an act that almost blinded me I almost I almost had to wear an eye patch the rest of my life she, my grandma would just slap me up all in the store and stuff and then turn around and come on give big mama a hug I don't want to hug you because you're violent I, I, but the God who will not surrender his purpose in your life the harder you go at your defiance, the harder he must break his redemption into your life. And what you may see as a smackdown on your road to mow madness is God's first act of redemption in your life. Clarity will come, but epiphany it's the sense of being overwhelmed by the surprise of God's presence. That about all I know at this point is what I can't do no more. What I must turn my face away from. Only then am I postured to see something different. To hear something different. And to see that all that stuff I've been doing in the name of God is really no more than blood on my hands. From which I must repent. Can't turn toward if you don't first turn away. Something has to end to begin again. Somebody here today needs to ask a question. What would you have me do Lord I'm yours Lord everything I have got everything I am everything I